Welcome the man, Morris Manning. Thank you, folks. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Wyatt and Barbara, for making this community feel like a home for all of us. These are, um, I'm not, sh I don't think I read any of these last summer. If I did, it's mo only one or two, but I think most of these are relatively new since like Thanksgiving. This is called Poof. I'm perfectly happy, and everything is right as rain, Mr. Bejesus. So thank you if you had anything to do with it. It's kind of strange to be happy. Well, relatively happy. Oh, sure, I have my share of struggles a blue day now and then. But I've found drinking a lot of whiskey always helps with that. <laughs> I have this problem of working pretty hard and trying to be kind and thinking, what's the point? I'd rather stare into space or a maze of trees on a warm spring day in a kind of transcendental haze. Under the trees when the sun is bright, there's a greenish haze that makes me happy. You just go in there and be quiet. I get tired of thinking about wars and people tearing up the earth. Some really terrible stuff goes on. I wish everybody could just be happy and have some fun. Go out and find your own green haze and stop destroying everything and killing and stop being mad at the world. We have a lot of lunatics and dangerous people running the show. But the good news is, under the trees, if you quietly sit in the green haze, the show doesn't exist. It's like, poof, it's gone. It's like you're somewhere else, and all of your troubles for a while are over. It doesn't last forever. It's not like eternity in there, unless you get all transcendental, and then it is eternity. <laughs> This is the one that I fear I may have read last summer, so sorry if it's a repeat. This is called Reading a Book in the Woods. The spindly trunks of two trees have twisted twice around each other. This is what I see when I look up from reading. I've read the page on the right, then turned to the left-hand page and read. I've read the book all out of order, beginning in the middle. Now, by looking up, I know the book is reading me. And there I am in a middle chapter, whistling, and knocking the back of my hand against the motionless fruits of a hawthorn tree, an action that has no consequence unless the lifted hand and the branch left swaying after are symbolic. I could see it that way, but also see how simple it is, how very little is happening. No memory is leaking out, no evident signs of despair. There's a sort of dot, dot, dot at this point in the book. And I don't think the ending offers much more. Maybe the sun goes down and someone whistles in the dark. Or maybe it ends with pale light still visible above the trees and one has been changed and walks farther into the woods and farther than that. This is, a, this is actually a, a couple of years old, this one. And uh, there's a couple of folks here who have been to the Appalachian Writers Workshop at the Heinemann Settlement School. And I don't see... There they are. <laughs> um, so I selected this for you all, especially. This is called The Way. Standing beside the tree invites belief. 
my spirit or soul answers an easy or crazy waving leaf, or even a motionless leaf, even in winter the stark unmoving branch, or from a distance the tree itself. But after belief, the preachers I heard when I was younger never said what happens then. Just go along and be alive? It's hard to live that way. For me it is. I remember seeing the way in bright lettering on a book and hearing about the path and wondering where we are going and when we will start and could I bring the dog. <laughs> that was 40 years ago when I traced my fingers over the letters and some time after that I knew how people suffer and grieve and sit there like a piece of wire stuck to a post. Beauty. We have opinions about beauty, whether something should be even or jagged or if a strangeness needs to be in it. I haven't preferred the kind of beauty that's lush. And I'm glad the bohemian thing never appealed to me. People earnestly trying to be artistic and bored with the world. How in the world could the world be boring? I think beauty's pretty important. It's good to have ideas about it, knowing over time they'll change. And you only need a little beauty before you notice its effects. It has a way of lingering and blowing the clouds out of your mind, and pretty soon you realize you're on the road to happiness. I tend to like a basic beauty, an inherent beauty that surprises, like a dragonfly that lights on the tip of a tall cattail leaf among the other cattails growing at the edge of a still pond in summer. I've heard that means a chance of rain, but there's a chance of everything. This image was presented to me today at evening time in the lush of summer beauty and the leaf so awkwardly tall and skinny put me in mind of a man wearing a suit of green topped with a bow tie and standing there as if he had paused to be reflective in the swale. The dragonfly was motionless and the sun was coming down the hill. The man was green to his neck, but missing, perhaps symbolically, his head. I like a beauty that's serene and mired, to be admired in stillness. I like a stream of consciousness, but I prefer a stream of crows crossing a paling, dusky sky, or better still, an actual stream, and the noisy beauty of the thing, and how the light will come down to it, and then the dark will come down to it. One of the great joys of my life is meeting other writer friends and having eventually the guts to write something for them. This is one I wrote for Claudia and Kent. <clears throat> An orchard at the bottom of a hill. Why don't you try just being quiet? <laughs> if you can find some silence, maybe you can listen to it. How it works is interesting. I really can't explain it, but you know it when it's happening. You realize you're marveling at apple blossoms and how they're clustered on the tree, and you see the bees meticulously attending every blossom there, and you think the tree is kind of humming. Such careful beauty in the making, and then you think it's really quiet. 
but I am not alone in this world. That's how you know it's happening. There's something solemn and wonderful in the quiet, a slow and steady ease. Whether the tree is actually sighing is beside the point. It's better to wonder. You needn't be precise with quiet. It just becomes another thing. It isn't a science. It's an art, like love, or a dog who's pretty good, asleep in the grass beneath the tree. Several of these newer poems are 14ers. This is one of those. <laughs> I'm not going to dignify it by calling it a sonnet. <clears throat> this is called The Weather. I was thinking the weather has hit a bit of a fickle patch and how I'd prefer a little less of the fickle, as if I'd say, hey, hold the fickle, God. <laughs> as if God has time for that. And then I thought, God's probably busy with other things, like trying to keep the world from going completely out of whack. And then I thought, who talks about a fickle patch? And then I thought, you're talking to yourself. <laughs> Just let it go. But then I thought, well, who knows? I wouldn't be surprised if God's not into fickle either. <laughs> we were, t some of us were talking about uh, Jill's lecture earlier in the conference, the importance of memory, and at supper time tonight, Tony and Jill and I were, and Rob we're talking about how wonderful it is to have something come back to your memory that you didn't know was leaving an impression at the original time of its occurrence. This is some of that. This is called Like Flicks of Flame. Flick. Like Flicks of Flame. There's very little point in keeping two yellowish red and black wings from a moth that's disarrayed one finds in the grass. I could have mistaken them for petals, but I knew what they were. And when I picked them up, the dust from the wings left smudges on my fingers, as grainy newsprint used to do when I delivered papers and rolled them as I went. When I came home, my hands revealed a blur of backward letters. The news was senseless. I liked to visit an old woman who lived in a room and had stories from the older time, and then a priest who lived at the end of my route. I believe the doors of heaven opened for both of them who are gone from this world and yet still matter in it. Now think about that miracle, a life that lives beyond the life. I would like to ask people to strive to do good. Make something of your lives. Let's try to be more hopeful and pay attention to the little things. painting. <clears throat> if you look at some of the old paintings where someone is gazing out with a blank or nondescript expression, I think the painter was wanting to express an idea and not the person or the spotless virtue of the person. This really doesn't bother me, but when you see in a painting someone whose eyes are closed because he's blinking, you tend to think that's pretty honest to see a human being that way. And you also think the person there was not the kind 
to sit around all day and mope or overly sigh and pretend to be brooding out the window with a vase of droopy flowers placed on the sill to magnify the brooding. <laughs> there might be a lemon cut in two on a board with one of the halves turned up to symbolize longing as if it's believable that someone would cut a lemon in two and leave it sitting expressively on a windowsill. <laughs> If I were a painter, I'd make the eyes a little clouded over because I'd want to indicate someone seeing something he couldn't see in reality. I'd take away the windowsill and the window. There wouldn't be a place for the vase or the weirdly sensual lemon. I'd put the old man outside with a haze of trees behind him, and above the trees I'd paint a significant patch of sky. I'd paint it blue, but darken it, to make it not quite clear if the man is going to sleep, or if he's drinking the dew, or if he's just content to stare into the world at night and not be worrying about his life or looking back on it. He might be waiting for the moon. A lot of people like looking at the moon or how it illuminates a haze of trees and leaves a glow. It's hard to complain about a glow. I just don't think a painting needs to be extravagant or dire in order to be beautiful. Probably a catfish. <laughs> I grew up learning, of all things, not to be happy. There was something wrong with happiness. We studied pity instead and the suffering in the world. The starving children in China was common for my mother to sight. I filled with pennies a little cardboard church to help. We did that every year for a while, even when our provisions were slight and the roof of the house was falling in. If you were happy or even allowed a laugh, you were not diligent. You were lazy and good for nothing, like your father, for instance. <laughs> None of this was very useful to learn. I doubt a single child in China was saved by all my boxes full of pennies. The suffering went on and grew and spread around the world. If you look for suffering, it won't take long to find it somewhere, hanging like a fog in a low and lonesome valley. The second time my father took me fishing, he didn't fish at all. He just stood there on the bank and watched as I fiddled with the cane pole and fitted its halves together. I bit an extra sinker onto the line and swung it out as far as I could. The fish that took it was strong enough to break the pole in two. So much for the all-American father and son. He shrugged, probably a catfish, he said. I looked out at the lake. It was mysterious and vague. There was something it contained beyond the water and the fish dragging half of a fishing pole behind it. A fog was settled in that valley, as cold and colorless as lead. It wasn't common suffering but there was something lonesome there, and probably someone around was starving. As Margot was very kind to point out earlier today, to this very day is the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I. This poem is called The Great War. 
strictly from the knowledge that my great-grandfather went over there to fight or to wait around in a trench as was required, and that he returned to garden and lose a son in the next world war and never to have the remains and to continue to work making of all things cardboard boxes, hopping a train over and back again the cold Ohio River for more than 50 years and losing two fingers to a saw. I can say he wasn't proud, not overly proud of war. He'd left one child at home, a seed to plant for the later war, and would have two more, but he went on with time, not knowing, as he told me once, quite why they'd gone over there. He wasn't polished enough to name it Europe or even France, and never reflected it didn't last, or how ironic it was to fight so nihilistically for peace. This was reserved for a boy in Kentucky born 50 years after the fact, and nearly 50 more by now, who's had the benefit of reflection and little hardship of his own. It's been a dark inheritance. He used to let me touch his stubs. I was a fascinated child, but he was not a talkative man. One day, when America wakes up, I'd like to talk about it all, the sacrifice. That's what it was, immeasurable, anonymous. An uncle on my mother's side went over there a hundred years ago and died, ironically, a doctor, dying to save the sick and the wounded men in the Great War. That's what they called it, the Great War. Here's a 14er. Two birds. Silas? Sil Did he leave? Okay. There's a little boy over there earlier who's a big fan of birds. I told him I'd read him a bird poem. He went to bed. <laughs> Two birds. The staves had rotted from a barrel, leaving me a few hoops. And prompted by an impulse to keep the world in a way alive, I hung a hoop on the end of the giant T made by a clothesline pole to see how it would look. And then I moved the hoop to the other end of the T and now I had a T and an O. Two. Nothing in particular or everything in general. I left it open-ended. Sometimes a pair of birds will perch in the hoop and then the double meanings fly. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is called the change. <laughs> I was doing a little reflection, you know, and that was going pretty well. <laughs> kind of <laughs> detaching from some things that needed detaching. Promising myself in my inner voice a kind of declaration. And then I dreamed I was declaring all sorts of things and proposed a brand new Bill of Rights. And number one was, people shall have the right to live without the fear of invisible oppressors ruining the world for everybody else. <laughs> and my inner voice quavered and sounded like I was giving a speech to myself, which popped my little freedom bubble because it came to my attention I wasn't detached at all from feeling a pretty grave concern for the world. And then I thought to myself, uh-oh, it looks like I'm going through the change. <laughs> I'm clearly losing my perspective. 
And then I said, now wait a minute, what kind of change are we talking about? <laughs> it was like a choice between seeing and going blind. But then in a sort of oratorical flourish, I said to myself, are there not many ways to see? And haven't you closed your eyes and still had vision? Well, that introduced some middle ground. <laughs> I realize now I've needed to consider, shall we say, other considerations. But I can still believe in trees and be glad for leaning over willows. It's been comforting to realize that. You have to live with hope. It's crazy to wave the flag of hope these days, but someone had better start doing it. You have to be nice, I said to myself, and try to be more positive. People will think you've lost it, going around waving the flag of hope and being nice and positive. I was expecting that. <clears throat> I think um, there are two French words in the reading tonight. This is the first one. It has nothing to do with French. Apropos of nothing. Would you please start thinking about your soul? I think it's a viable question to ask. And I'd say a lot of Americans who are too pious or afraid to question anything like this would be wise to take a moment and think about the soul. It's kind of murky. And it's easy to think your soul is like your own personal dewdrop, a watery spark among countless others shimmering in a field, your essence, your quintessence. Perhaps it's a bit more complicated than that. I was thinking about this recently when I was hoeing a row of beans. The repetition had freed my mind. You have to keep the weeds away, but you also have to loosen the soil to nourish the roots and give them air. The plant grows more underneath the ground than it does above. And the roots are the source of the necessary bloom above. The bloom begins in the roots, in the unseen pattern that grows below, instilling itself into the bloom. And the pattern is made to be repeated. I was going in and out of being aware of my thoughts, aware of the hoe in my hands, unknowingly lost in the rhythm of swinging and bending and following the long, imperfect line of the row. It was a perfect reverie. I was participating in time, though not quite conscious of it, but being conscious wasn't the point. The point was to participate in time, in the mystical sense of time. I can't tell you how pleasant it is to illuminate the soul, to be up on a hill at the edge of woods that roll over the hills and seem to be unending, to be a human being, tending a garden and being alive, becoming part of the garden itself. Oh, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> this is another kooky one called Pure Thoughts. I was thinking, sort of asking myself, really, if I had had any thoughts in the last little while that could be described as unclean, and I thought of one. I had, I had this fantasy of making a couple of people who believe their right to make money allows them to do whatever they want so they can make even more money. I had this daydream in which they saw the error of their ways, 
thanks to my sympathy for them as fellow human beings and such. I sat them down and said, now look, does beauty matter to you? When was the last time you savored silence? Isn't there something special about a tree? Aren't rivers wonderful? If you study birds, you really see how they're a lot like fish, right? Do you consider some kind of God, you know, in the cosmic sense, someone who's watching what we do and how we treat each other in the earth? So I had this syllogism going with these fat cat types and capped it off with this. Boys, does a phrase like metaphysical consequences ring a bell for you? <laughs> and that was just too far. I sort of blew it. They squirmed at the mention of consequences, and then they got really defensive and said I sounded like a regulator, and it was I who was the extremist in the room. And then I said I hoped God would open up the earth and throw them into the lake of fire. <laughs> a nice touch with that illusion, I thought. Well, anyway, I dreamed myself into an argument with imaginary fat cats and somewhere in there I realized I was having very bad thoughts and bad thoughts are not good. Someone very wise once said that. So I tried to have some pure thoughts to counteract the bad ones because the metaphysical consequences is something I learned in Sunday school. But I was stumped. I couldn't think a pure thought, and it really stung that they had called me an extremist. They used it like a dirty word. I had to go outside and look at the sky and just not think for a while, and I was sorry for my behavior. an age of lies. In sixth or seventh grade, when someone said something that went beyond the truth, which could have been a boast or a slight or some exaggerated claim, the one who disbelieved the claim or felt the slight said, you a lie. Not you're a liar, but you a lie. The meaning could survive the grammar. And if a bolder lie were made, then you a damn lie was said with an added syllable in the curse for emphasis. As I recall, this sort of thing was all in fun. An audience would be there in laughter. I must have said it several times, but I haven't heard it said for years. It was local lingo for a while and maybe didn't travel far and some other lingo took its place. But it's pretty grave if you think about it. You a lie, so plainly stated. Or just to imagine hearing it if you're standing in a room or stopped in the middle of a field watching in a lower field what looks to be a black cat hunched on the top of a fence post. That's what I was doing when I recalled a local expression for dishonesty. Looking at a cat down in a field, it was puffed up against the cold and motionless. The fence post looked like it was thinking something dark. And then I thought, we're living in an age of lies and colorful expressions and such, and who knows what will come of it. Just a couple more. Forgiveness. I find it questionable that one sets out to do something abstract, as if it's second nature to fool around with concepts not connected to anything real. It isn't. It's weirder than weird to think about abstraction. I mean, it's nearly impossible. Most of the time, I begin with a tree or a raindrop and see what happens. 
Not long ago, I wedged a somewhat rusted coffee can in the notch of a tree to see if a wren would build her nest there, and perfectly she did. It is a very artistic creation, and to hear her singing from the lip of the can puts one in mind of beauty. That's Abstraction 101, and it all began with a can and a tree and a bird who needed a place to live. I sometimes wonder if everything is simply waiting to be transformed. I can't consider forgiveness without seeing just before the word occurs to me a room in my mind with a candle burning in it. I see the candle and maybe a play of shadows and feel my way into the room. The candle is at the other end and gives off precious little light. Obviously, there's something else in the room. It wouldn't bother me if it were the very hound of heaven with all the austerity that implies. And I wouldn't mind it if the candle dimmed to going out but didn't. I'll read two more. I can't see that. T for Tennessee. Many things go on in the mind, some doodlings and disconnections, and then a pleasant stream begins to trickle out of the so-called ground, and soon the sun is shining on it, and for a moment a little world made up becomes the realer one, and trees are leaning over the stream, and pools of water glow and dot the course as it glitters into the distance. It's not like sitting down and thinking. It's not like for the umpteenth time wondering what it was that scarred your father's life, or remembering the time you watched a train go by and the two men just looked at you from the door of the car where they were sitting when you waved, and how the open door illuminated them or seemed to turn them into ghosts. No, no, the invention of the stream is not like any of these. It stands for something. It's metaphorical. Although, it's interesting how the stream resembles the railroad track, how both convey infinity, and how haunting it is to look that way. Two more, sorry, I've got a miscounted. This is the other poem that has a French word in it. Um, I do not know French, but I don't let that hold me back. <laughs> <clears throat> Some of uh, many people here do know French, and you know that you have to come up with all these little marks to put over words, letters and words and things that that we don't you have to fool with in English. Um, one of those words is uh, flaneur. And the A requires this little thing that goes like that. Don't tell me what it is. I don't want to know. <laughs> this, is, this is called a flaneurish phrase. Just writing the phrase, a flaneurish phrase, is fun because you have to put that little hat-like thing above the A in flanourish, as if the word is planning a little stroll. <laughs> it looks like a pretty serious hat to me, not leaning over like a beret. He's probably doffed a coat as well. Perhaps flanourish is going out to get an affordable bottle of wine, and he wants to wear a serious hat to make buying a bottle of wine seem more respectable. I don't know. It's a free country. He might be wearing his lucky wine-buying hat. Flanourish 
could get some hard bread while he's out and a little chunk of cheese. That's perfectly respectable. <laughs> he could tip his hat on his way out of the wine and cheese emporium and the little bell would ding behind him. And then he could stroll back home to his wife who has a musical French name. They could have a little wine and cheese. He could shower her with flaneurish phrases and she could be impressed and wooed. And then she'd yawn and say, Flaneurish, take off that goofy hat and come to bed. Let's go to bed, my darling. <laughs> Thank you all again. Thanks to the wonderful staff, Megan, Adam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The world is filled with love. People are filled with love, I guess, because the world is filled with love. The birds sing, the wind in spring gets all jostly, and the sun comes up as greenish as a sprout sprung on the wavy, woozy horizon. Who doesn't love a woozy horizon? <laughs> it's easy to see such happiness. The littlest life alive inspires because itself becomes inspired. If that's not love, then I'm the king of Prussia or some other place defunct. <laughs> it doesn't sound like Prussia was ever very funked. <laughs> Who wants to come from Prussia or rule it? Despots are never filled with love. It's not their thing. They'd rather be despotic. A lot. And extremely rich people are never filled with love because they can't attend the world, as it were. Their attention is directed elsewhere. They probably have little spurts of passion, but are never filled with love. It's like they've hurt themselves and pillaging, diminishing the world, as many of them do, will only make them emptier. Mark my words, the world is filled with love. I mean it. I'm serious about this, folks. If you wake up in the morning and don't feel filled with love, there's something wrong with you. You've got a major problem on your hands. Laughter